You know how sometimes you'll meet someone and things just click? You quickly discover that you have lots of shared interests and experiences, and your conversation just flows as it goes down one path and then the next. Well, that's exactly what happened in this episode. A few of the paths that our conversation took included growing native plants, examples of how insects and native plants interact with each other, stories from our childhoods, ways to combat invasive species using native plants, simple ways to attract wildlife to your property, and so much more. This was one of those conversations that could easily have occurred, sitting on the front porch or around a campfire. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed recording it. Nature isn't just out there in some far-off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I want to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, you can do so for less than the cost of a cup of coffee or a meal at your favorite fast food place. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. Today we are talking to Dr. Randy Eckel. Randy is the owner of Toadshade Wildflower Farm, which is a mail-order native plant nursery. She describes herself as a lifelong naturalist, lover of nature, entomologist, and confirmed plant and ecology nerd, which is a description that I love and can relate to on many different levels. Hi, Randy. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Hi, Shannon. Thank you for talking with us today. So glad to be here. Glad to be able to uh, to connect with you and have this conversation. Oh, yes. And I am so excited to talk with you because it's always fun to just share stories with and learn from others who love native plants and insects and gardening with native plants and really pretty much anything and everything that has to do with nature. So <laughs> I am completely confident that this is going to be a really fun conversation and one of those that I'm really not 100% sure where we're going to end up with, but sometimes those can be the best. And we'll see where we go. Yes, exactly. But before we go too far, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got interested in native plants? Sure. Uh, so I was a nerdy kid. I just was. Um, I was going out apparently in my pajamas staring at the insects that came to the windows at night i was filching bird seed and planting it in a little piece of ground to figure out what came up i didn't i wasn't i didn't think birds were going to grow from the bird seed but i knew they were seeds and i didn't know what came from those seeds i was very impressed when it came up as little looked like grass seedlings to me i know now that it was probably white millet um, but I was, I was a nerdy kid that was very interested in the outdoor world. I spent a lot of time in the creek that was near my house, um, in and around the creek, turning over rocks, exploring. When I went to college, I studied plant science and botany and discovered the world of entomology while I was there, the study of insects. So I, I started with plants. I really got excited about insects. And then I went to graduate school and really all the work that I did in graduate school and at the USDA after I finished graduate school was looking at plant insect interactions because one, they, they need each other. Mm -hmm. um, plants need insects, insects need plants. And um, so then after I'd worked for the USDA for a little while, I took a hard left turn and decided to found my own native plant nursery, which grows only native plants. Toadshade Wildflower Farm, we're a mail order nursery. Native plants is all we do. Well, and talk about native plants, and educate people about native plants. But um, but that's sort of the short version of how, how I got to where I am. And I started that back in 1996. So I've been at this for a little while. Yes, just a wee bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it's always interesting to hear 
different people's stories and how they got into what they're doing now and how they've looked at all these different interactions, because lots of us have come at things from different directions and then found those interactions and then taken those left turns or right turns or multiple different turns throughout <laughs> the years to get to where we're at now. And it's always fun and interesting to hear how people got to where they are. I had a fabulous professor when I was at the University of Delaware. Uh, his name was Dale Bray. He was the head of the Department of Entomology. And he had a very popular introduction to entomology course. You know, and I was I was taking botany classes. I was taking plant science classes. It was a very popular class because it was a fabulous teacher. And one of the things that I like to point out to people is, you know, no one goes into their guidance counselor in high school and the guidance counselor says, oh, you might want to be an entomologist. I don't think, you know, that, that's not even a, a, an idea that, that surfaces. These are one of these, these fields of science that you learn about as you grow and learn and figure out just how complex the world really is. Yes, exactly. I think a lot of those natural resources, ecology type fields and careers are the same way. They're not the ones that you typically hear about when you go talk to your guidance counselor, or at least it wasn't when I was in high school. <laughs> well, it wasn't when I was in high school either. And I think we went to high school a few years apart. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and from what I hear from people that I know that are younger, that are in high school or recently into college, it's still not the most common thing. I think it's a little bit more common now, depending on where you're at, but not as, not as common as some of the other careers. I think that's true. Well, since you brought up Toad Shade already and how long Toad Shade has been around, you've probably seen a lot of changes in the industry. Yeah. Can you share some of those with us? Well, you know, even, even when I was in college, uh, I remember finding somewhere along the line some notes from a horticulture professor that I had at the University of Delaware who was talking about this tiny little niche area of native plants. Um, and even uh, when I started the business in 96, um, it was still pretty niche. Um, one of the reasons I started it was because I couldn't find native plants. I distinctly remember going to a nursery and I just wanted a red oak. I wanted a Quercus rubra, a red oak. And they couldn't help me. They didn't know what that was. They were, I was like, what do you mean you don't know? It's like, none of our oaks are red. I'm like, no, no, it's a species. It's a plant. They didn't know what I was talking about. And it was similar with a lot of the wildflowers that I had grown up with um, in the woods in Northern Delaware. Um, they just weren't ever available in the trade. So, you know, back, back in the 90s, there were some wholesale nurseries just starting to get going where it was available to folks that were doing restoration projects and, and very large projects, but your average homeowner couldn't find them. Um, and in many ways, they didn't know why they would want to find them. Uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of folks did not realize how important native plants were to not just national parks, but to our own backyards, you know, to our own communities, um, you know, that they're, that they're important host plants to all kinds of creatures, large and small, and that native plants in a landscape really bring that landscape alive um, by allowing it to support caterpillars and moths and birds and salamanders and bigger birds that eat the smaller birds and all kinds of things in, in a community. Um, so yeah, since that time, there, there are many more options to get a hold of native plants, but it's still a niche business. And most of the larger companies are still wholesale businesses. So it is still in many areas, it's difficult for folks to find native plants, particularly plants that are native to their region. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of an important 
distinction with native plants. There are a few plants that are native to California and the East Coast, but not very many of them. <laughs> so mostly, you know, if you're looking at native plants, you should be looking at native plants that are native to your region. Um, I was talking to a gentleman the other day who was uh, talking to us. They, they live in Texas um, and they were looking for some particular plants. And I said, well, you, you might want to look to some of the native plant nurseries in Texas uh, because very few of the things were up in the Northeast. Um, we're in Northwestern New Jersey where seven or eight different eco regions all sort of come together, which gives us a very, very high level of plant and animal diversity in this area. But there's not a lot in common between the Northeast and the Texas Panhandle. Just not a whole lot there. A lot more between us and where you are, for example, mm -hmm. down in Kentucky, because one of those eco regions comes all the way up from Kentucky and ends right about five miles that direction, actually. <laughs> and I think people nowadays, it seems to me, are a little bit more, more aware and more interested, mm -hmm. or at least open to the idea of native plants and creating these, creating these miniature ecosystems for pollinators and songbirds and any other critters that our yards can <laughs> maintain, depending on how big your yard and property is, uh, is what all it can really support. I mean, there are there are limitations there, depending on the home range of the different animals that we're talking about and stuff like that. But it seems to me like people are, in general, are a little bit more open and aware and interested in asking questions now than they were, say, in the mid to late 90s. Absolutely. But even, you know, small properties can make a huge difference. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, there was research that was done in, in Washington, D.C. by Desiree Narango that showed in Washington, D.C., which, as most people can probably picture, most of the properties in, in D.C. are not huge. Um, they were looking at nesting chickadees. And for a nest of chickadees, a single nest of chickadees, to have enough caterpillars to feed its young, you need, I believe it was 80% or more of the entire foliage, all the biomass of plants on the property to be native plants. Because our native insects simply can't, they can't feed on, or they don't even recognize as food, plants from other parts of the world. You know, so they're not going to lay their eggs on them. And if they do, sometimes their offspring will die. So we, we need those native plants to support enough insects, which are really sort of the, you know, despite the, what some people think with the number of deer that feed on people's properties, deer are not the primary herbivores. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's insects. It's insects. You know, the, the, the plants collect the energy from the sun. And then the next level up is insects. But the reason our plants don't look tattered is because while the insects are feeding, the birds are feeding on the insects. That's that's how we sort of move up the trophic levels. So um, so yeah, it's it's very exciting for people, even with very small properties, to put in some native plants and then suddenly discover that they are attracting wildlife, that they are raising caterpillars that are turn into butterflies or raising caterpillars that get eaten by the birds, one of the two, it's very exciting for them to be able to make those sorts of changes, even in a small property. Oh yeah, it doesn't matter how small your property is, even a even a balcony yes. uh, in an apartment can make such a huge difference for like you were talking about the insects, for the songbirds, because mm -hmm. even the caterpillars that get eaten by the birds, they may not turn into um, butterflies or moths, but they turn into pretty birds. They turn uh, into birds, exactly. <laughs> I'll take that too. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, um, you know, we deal with um, uh, not a few folks that, that that live in cities. And I mean, there's, there's, there's rooftop gardens, there's balconies and songbirds that are attracted to them and hummingbirds that are attracted to them and butterflies and moths and bees um, of all different sorts. I mean, in, a, in our area, 
there's something like 400 different species of native bee. Um, and, you know, the folk, you start looking and, and it's just like, oh, that's a different one. And that's a different one. And that's a different one coming to all these different flowers. Um, and it's really, it's really exciting to be able to invite that sort of wildlife into your garden by integrating native plants into your landscape. I mean, I just think it's fun. I think a garden that's full of life is a lot more interesting. I'm right there with you. And I kind of came to it all from a slightly different aspect because I was always, I was like you, I was the nature nerd, the science nerd. I was <laughs> always out running around in the um, old cattle pasture that okay. was behind our house. We didn't own it, but we had permission. As long as my brother and I didn't mess up anything, we could go play. <laughs> and there was, they didn't have many cows in it. There was lots of wilder areas and I loved going out and exploring and trying to find my own little places that nobody had ever found before um, but they had a cow pond and I was always in the pond grabbing the tadpoles and bringing home water to put underneath my microscope and look at it and watching the birds and I came out of very much from a wildlife biology standpoint I was interested in the animals is what got mm -hmm. me interested and then I had to take field botany and systematic botany and all of that because the plants are the basis for everything and I had this amazing field botany teacher who would tell stories about the plants as he was teaching them nice and for me I started out well, the plants are just something for my critters to eat um, <laughs> basically. so I was like one to two levels removed from the plants but he would tell these amazing stories about the plants did this and this was how they interacted with and, and or this is how people used them in the past and those stories about the plants got me interested and the plants for the plants sake mm -hmm. and then later on as I started growing native plants in my garden years later and doing that I, I started watching the plants and the animals that were on the plants which are going to be the insects and then I was like, oh, wait a minute, that one's different. And that one's different. And that one's different. And oh, cool. And then I'm down the whole pollinator <laughs> rabbit hole. And it's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> one more thing to learn about and geek out about. Absolutely. I loved your story about the uh, the, the pond. Um, I had a duck pond behind my house that lived on, that was on the neighbor's property. And um, with a strain that ran through it and... Um, Quite frankly, I was always getting in trouble with my mother for falling into the creek um, <laughs> or the duck pond because which, well, a little dirty. Um, but you know, what was what was living in that? I, you know, I loved it when I went to college, you know, after, you know, my poor mother having put up with me, you know, constantly being in the creek, constantly being like in and around the duck pond. Um, and then I took a class uh, in graduate school with immature insects. Well, wow. So I got to go and go to the duck pond and wade into the duck pond for a graduate class. And I was dipping out all kinds of wonderful creatures out of there and putting them under the microscope. Oh, my poor mother, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I, I tormented my mother some too. She always said that she was more afraid of what would be in my pockets than my brother's pockets. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember my brothers getting in trouble for falling into the creek and the pond repeatedly. And I wasn't really falling in. I would just sort of wade in and, you know, that was referred to as falling in. It was like, oops, oops. sorry, my <laughs> clothes are soaking wet and covered with mud. Oops, but look what I found, mom. Uh, yeah, it was, um, it was a good place to grow up. Oh, yes. Same here. So what are some of the recommendations that you would make for someone who is wanting to get started to growing native plants? Well, you know, just start. Now, I know that's a terrible way to, to you know, that, that's perhaps terrible advice, but a lot of people are, they're not quite sure where to go, you know, how to start, what to do. They're intimidated by, it's like, oh, do I need to tear out my entire garden? No, don't tear out your entire garden. <laughs> You know, start with something. You know, if I if I look at a landscape and somebody wants to know where to start making a difference, the first thing I usually say is remove invasive species. You know, learn about most areas now you can, most states, you can find a list of the invasive species in your state. If you have invasive species on your property, 
remove them. Invasive species are alien species that are very aggressive. They spread a lot and they really support no wildlife. Our caterpillars, our beetles, our bees really don't use them in a useful way, particularly the caterpillars. Um, they need host plants. So first remove that or in another way to look at it, if you have a dead plant on your property or a tree that comes down, don't be like, oh my God, the shrub died, the tree died, whatever. It's an opportunity. It's like, great, you've got a space to put stuff. Think about the native plants that might fit that area and be honest about the space. You know, I, in all gardening, I think garden fails are when people lie about, and we all lie to ourselves, but they lie about the space that they have. You know, the property where I grew up was very, very wooded. It was, the entire property really was in heavy shade. There was this one little garden that my mother would put plants in that needed full sun, hoping that they would do what they were never going to do. Well, we lived in the woods. My mother had no full sun. Be honest with yourself. If you have very dry soil, look to native plants that are native and adapted to dry soil conditions. Um, one of the great things about native plants is that there's an enormous diversity of native plants. So wherever your region is, there are gonna be plants or your state, there are gonna be plants that are adapted to dry soil and wet soil. There's gonna be plants that are adapted to acid soil and clay soil, and maybe sandy soil, gravelly soil. There are native plants adapted to all those different conditions. There are plants that are will grow in full shade. There are plants that will grow in full sun, but don't take the ones that want full sun and put them in full shade. They're never going to be happy there. And remember that all plants grow. It may take time. It's great fun to plant a small tree, plant a little oak tree, plant a little beech tree, plant a little filbert nut tree. I love filbert nut trees and watch them grow over time. But remember, they're going to grow. That's what plants do. Um, we, we, we tend to forget about that sometimes when our, we design our gardens and like, well, we want to make it look full really fast. So we put everything really close together. And then the next year, they're like, oh, my God, it grew. You know, they put an American holly right next to their driveway where they get into their car and it grows and suddenly they have thorny leaves next to where they're getting into their car. That was not a good choice. Um, or right next to the house. Or right next to the house. Yes, uh, there's a there's a gentleman who shall remain nameless <laughs> who uh, got a bunch of plants from us one year, a couple of years running. And then eventually he sent me a picture because he had planted them all. These were all herbaceous perennials. These were plants that grow and then die back to the ground every year. But he planted them all within about six inches of the side of his garage. So he had all these plants that were just leaning out. It was the strangest looking garden. And he said, would this look better if I moved some of them out a little further from the house? I was like, well, yes, that, that would probably help a little bit, but he, he put in small plants or plants in the spring when they were still dormant and he forgot that plants grow. So it's always important to think about that, that your garden's going to grow. It's also going to change. You know, a garden in a wet year is going to look different than a garden in a dry year. A garden five years after you design it is going to look different than it is 10 years after you design it and certainly different than it does the first year you put it in. I like that advice of just start because I do. I think we all get in our heads too much sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we get in our way. We get in our own way. It's just, oh, no, I need to redesign the whole yard. No, you don't need to redesign the whole yard. Pick, pick a spot. I tell people to do the same thing weeding. You know, they're like, oh, I have so many weeds. Just like, just, just pick, pick a spot mm -hmm. um, where you're going to tackle the invasive species, for example. Um, you know, people with, with larger properties or or with a with a long hedgerow that has a problem, just like don't don't try to tackle the whole thing. Start at one end and 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 just just move forward. Um Rome wasn't built in a day and native plant gardens evolve over time. Yeah. 
Exactly. And I can definitely vouch for the invasive species problems because <laughs> we have about 40 acres. So we're not large, but we're not small either by any stretch. How many did you say? Almost 40. 40. Yeah. So we're kind of in that good sized medium, what I would call range. And yeah, we are covered up in invasive species. And there are days when I just look out and it's like, I'm not careful. I just totally get overwhelmed looking at it. And it's like, yeah, no, start on one thing, get rid of it, defend it, and then just move out from there. And I mean, I know it's, it's not going to be a one and done thing. It's right. going to take time, but yeah, I mean, even on smaller properties, it's the same thing. I mean, they can be quite overwhelming when you start looking at it sometimes, but like you said, just start and do what you can and keep going. And when you have invasive species like shrubs, you know, one of the one of the things that you can try to do is if it's an invasive shrub, get the roots. Mm -hmm. Like get the roots in, but replace it with something intentional. Yes. Just like I've yanked that out. I'm going to put in a viburnum, which produces wonderful berries for the wildlife in the winter and has great fall color and beautiful flowers in the spring. You know, rip that out and replace it with staghorn sumac, which oh, yes. is wonderful for pollinators and the birds love those berries in the winter. And it's that one forms a colony, which is nice. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we get a lot of questions about is particular species that you can use to combat invasive species. Well, First of all, there are no magic wildflower bean seeds that you can just sprinkle and all the invasive species are going to run away. That's oh, not going to work. I wish. Um, yeah, I know. I know. Um, but, you know, there are some tricks like pulling out something and replacing it with something more intentional. Yes. Uh, one of the one of the invasive species up in the northeast, which is terrible, terribly problematic, is Japanese stilt grass. I don't know if that's a particular oh, plague in Kentucky. Yes, all right. our oh, our woods are covered. Well, there is there is a plant called uh, deer tongue grass, mm -hmm. Dichanthallium clandestinum, and it grows very densely. It's a native grass, and it's the only plant I know of that in even in part sun, not full shade, but in part sun. It'll outcompete Japanese still grass. Nice. Which is lovely. And so it's called clandestinum, and I love this. So it flowers twice, which is very weird for a grass. So the first flower expands out of the out of the tip of the sheath, does lovely things, produces seeds, does it looks lovely. Mm -hmm. And then it produces another flower later in the season that never expands out of the sheath. It's sort of hidden inside there. It's like a little cone of bird seed you know you know you, you feed goats at the zoo and they give you the little cone of seed seed to, or, or, or food for the goats mm -hmm. with just this little cone of seeds and the chickadees come and just sit on there and just feed on the little seeds that are down in their little seed cones it's so much fun to watch um but that's a really nice one for um for a meadow plant mm -hmm. or the edge of a meadow even because it will take quite a bit of not deep shade but it will take a fair amount of part shade um to outcompete Japanese stilt grass. So it's, if you just are constantly trying to remove just the invasives and that's all you're doing, it's just, it's gonna be really depressing if nothing else, um, but try to replace it with something. And you're going to want some of the bigger, more aggressive native plants if you're trying to outcompete invasive species in the first place. Right. And I mean, I think that's a mistake that happens a lot is that people will, remove an invasive species and be so focused on getting rid of the invasive species that all they're doing is removing, which just leaves vacuums and holes that more invasive species are going right. to come into. Whereas if you could plant something there, then at least that space is being used. And like you said, if you pick aggressive native plants, yeah, they've got a shot. They, they have a shot. Yes. Especially if you're out there helping them by keeping the invasive species from coming back. Right. You know, the, 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 the delicate little lovely wildflowers, you know, spring beauties, <laughs> spring beauties aren't going to outcompete anything. No, you know, we, we love them. We love them, but they're not going, you know, they're, yeah, they're not going to outcompete anything. Golden Alexanders, which is a nice woodland species, Zizia aria, 
you. That at least has got a nice semi-evergreen base. It can help to compete against some of the invasive species. Um, you know, you're, you, you need something with a little more, a little more oomph if you're trying to outcompete invasives. And I think that's one reason why I do go for when I'm planting just around my own property, I go a lot for some of those more aggressive species because I know what I've got on my property and I'm trying <laughs> to keep them out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, the, the slow growing, you know, delicate, wonderful ones. I mean, they're great, mm -hmm. um, but they, they may need a little more help if, if you have a problem with invasive species to keep them at bay, but your wildlife will appreciate your efforts. You know, we've got, you know, an area that used to have some Japanese stilt grass in our meadow. We now have gentians oh, nice. you know, that bloom in that part of the meadow. It's right on the edge. So it's a little bit moist. And they, they struggled a little bit with the drought that we had this year, but I know they're going to come back. They just weren't very floriferous this year. Um, but they're a great plant because they're, they're a wonderful plant to watch them get pollinated. Have you ever watched a gentian get pollinated? The closed gentians, mm. gentiana clausa. And gentiana andrusiae. So they're they're called blind or closed gentians because to the naked eye, they never open. They, they they look entirely closed. Well, bumblebees force their way into that flower, and the end of it unfurls a little bit like one of those old coin purses, you know, which you used to pinch it. And then the bumblebee goes, and then you just see the bumblebee butt sticking out <laughs> of the end of the flower. And well, it's in there doing its thing, and then it flies off again, and the flower closes right back up again. You know, they're entirely pollinated by these bumblebees that just muscle their way in there, which is which is great fun to watch. I bet that would be fun to watch. Yeah, I think you you should you should, uh, should get yourself some gentians. Yeah, I, I think I need to get me some gentians. Keep an eye out for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them like out and walking and stuff like that on hikes and stuff, but we don't have any on our property, and I've never been in the right place at the right time to actually watch them get pollinated. Yes. Well, if they're if they're in flower, you know, just sort of if it's a nice day, just you know, park yourself, you know, sit down and and wherever you are in a in a in a park or in a woodland, and just sit down and park yourself and and watch for a few minutes, and the bumblebees will come along, and it's just so much fun to watch. It's so unlikely because it's um, you don't you don't expect bees to go muscling into flowers like that. But those different pollination methods and. Those interactions, like you said, between the insects and the flowers that they're pollinating are just can be absolutely amazing to watch. Oh, they're, they're so they're so adorable. This the spring beauties I was talking about before. There's a bee specialist, a native bee specialist whose name I do not remember off the top of my head. But when the bees are finishing collecting pollen, their pollen baskets are pink mm -hmm. because it's pink pollen, you know, which is just cute. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's cute. It is so amazing. But yeah, no, I know which when you're talking, I can picture the bee and I can't think of the name. Of I it. can't remember the name off the top of my head. It'll come to, it'll come to me as soon as we're done the podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, it is so, it's so much fun to watch them work or, or the ones that are um, violet pollinators mm -hmm. that are just, I mean, it's the same sort of story. They'll just all they're collecting is the pollen from the violets. It's not the pretty pink of the spring beauties, no. but. <laughs> yeah, but I love violets. I mean, violets were one of those things as a kid. I used to bring my mother bouquets of flowers. I would bring her violets. I would bring her spring beauties. I would bring her uh, dog tooth violets, which some people call trout lilies. I don't know what the Kentucky phrase is for them. But they're, they're erythroniums. Trout lilies. There we go. My husband calls them trout lilies. I call them dog tooth violets. Um, but you know, the violets, they're the state flower of New Jersey and a bunch of other states, actually. But people are so busy trying to keep them off their lawns. Well, violets are the host plant of great spangled fritillaries. Great spangled fritillaries do not carefully search out host plants to lay their eggs. They are casual at best. Um, you know, they lay the eggs sort of maybe almost near a violet plant, <laughs> maybe. Um, the egg hatches in November. The caterpillar eats the egg case because that's all that mom really did useful was leave the egg case. And then it has to go, this tiny little caterpillar has to go marching off trying to find a violet plant. Feeds a little bit over winters as a tiny caterpillar, finishes feeding in the spring. 
And then we get these beautiful big butterflies. They're as big as a monarch butterfly. Everybody admires them. Nobody seems to know what the name of them are. Like those are the great spangled fritillaries. But the scattered distribution of violets is perfectly co-evolved with the scattered distribution of the way the butterflies lay their eggs. If you have, you know, a giant lawn and it's perfect and it's nothing but Kentucky bluegrass, which by the way, isn't native. No. And you're like, oh, but I kept a little tiny patch of violets in this little planter for the great spangled fiddlers. Well, the caterpillars are never going to find those violets. Violets shoot their seeds. There's a scattered distribution of plants, which perfectly matches the scattered distribution that the great spangled fritillaries use for their eggs. You know, they've co-evolved. And after all, why are flowers in the lawn a bad thing? I've never gotten that either. I like it because just the solid green, it's like, eh, that's boring. I like all the pops of color throughout, but then I've never been the one that's had the perfect green yard either. It's whatever <laughs> happens to grow in there. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, I confess to the same. We, uh, I have a lot of diversity in my lawn, um, which is interesting because my, my dad did too. My dad was not, he was not a naturalist. You know, he had grown up in a city and he was very interested in his lawn. But as far as he was concerned, as long as it was green, that was fine. It didn't matter if it was, we had spring beauties all over our lawn. Um, we had uh, red seeded plantain all over our lawn, which actually makes a really nice ground cover. Um, there was some grass, there was some grass mixed in. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we had, we had um, trout lilies uh, all over the lawn. We had, we had, I mean, the back corner, he didn't usually mow this. And we had Solomon seal growing in the back corner of the property. Um, beautiful. Yeah. You know, and moss, you know, it was, it was, it was a beautiful place to, mm -hmm. to grow up. Um, and we had a lot of diversity of wildlife on that property because we had, we had woods behind us. And I think because we had that pond and stream behind us, you know, one of the things just circling back to the, to the water story, one thing that people can do to really encourage wildlife on their property, in addition to using native plants, is to put in any sort of water feature, you know, a bird bath, a tiny pond. You know, and I'm not talking, and I hope I don't insult too many, I'm not talking about a koi pond. I'm talking about a natural pond where you're going to have frogs and salamanders and turtles and birds coming in to take drinks and bees coming in to take drinks and butterflies butterflies love mud there's a <laughs> they, they 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 the adults go after mud puddles to get minerals um it's called puddling which i think is a really cute name you know we live um our property we're actually on top of a a, a hill um uh, we're in Frenchtown, which is along the Delaware River, but we're up on the hill over top of Frenchtown on a dry hill with very rocky soil. And we put in, many years ago now, we put in a tiny little pond. And the wildlife that came to our pond, despite the fact that we're, we're less, as, as the crow flies, we're less than a mile from the Delaware River. Um, but the wildlife that would come to our pond, I remember one of the first winters, we had wild turkeys lined up like little old men at a drinking fountain, just like lining up, waiting for their turn at our pond, which was fun. And you know, we had turtles start using the pond. Um, we, I think we have four, four different species of salamander on the property now that we've identified. Mm -hmm. And so we, so we put in a bigger pond, yay. Um, <laughs> and uh, set up a trail cam um, to try to get some pictures. And so far the, uh, the big pond's only been in place for a couple of years now, but the funnest thing that we had, we get, had a great blue heron in common was, um, I think, uh, feasting on, quite, quite frankly, some of our frogs <laughs> that we have in the pond. But that's okay. That's okay. Um, we have a lot of frogs in the pond now. Oh, yeah, we've got a pond too. And it's, like you said, full of frogs and everything. But yeah, we've, we had a trail cam on it. For a little bit we keep moving the trail cams around um, yeah we do too yeah for a while it was on the pond and we had um of course we had herons great blue herons come in and nice. um, fishing through one two of the craziest things that we saw um one we caught an otter on trail cam 
Very nice. Yes, we were super excited about that. Um, most of the fish that the previous owners had stocked disappeared at the same time. How odd. <laughs> How odd, yeah. In fact, we actually noticed that we weren't seeing as many fish coming up. And that started making us think and wonder. Then we checked the trail cam and, yep, there's the otter. But so that was really fun to see. But then the other thing that was just like really amazing and fun was we had an owl that was fishing. It's the only thing we can think of. Well, not really fishing. It was probably going after frogs, but it would fly in and did it two or three owl. times. And it was a video one. So we would watch it fly in and it would splash and kind of act like it was trying to um, grab something in its talons. We never could actually see anything in the talons, but act like it was grabbing something and then flap. And it was um, in the shallow area. Wow. So the only thing we could think of was frogging. <laughs> I've never even heard of them doing that. That's that's crazy. Yeah, it was a bar. It was so much fun. Wow. Okay, I'm I have a bunch of birder friends. I'm gonna have to share that story with them because that is <laughs> that that's a new one on me. Um, we did we did watch a we did watch a, a bard owl pick up a, a uh, bat out of our back meadow one night when we were sitting oh, there, cool. which was that was that was great fun. It like flew over our heads and just like it's like whoa. Okay, they do that. Let's look that one up. But back to the water. You don't need to have 40 acres no. and a pond with fish and great blue herons to make a difference. You can just, just the smallest amount of water. Mm -hmm. um, if you can make it trickle, that actually brings in the wildlife. The birds love the sound of trickling water. But just a little bit of water um, can be terrific. And if you just sit and watch it, just you know, go out you know, with your... With your your drink of choice, <laughs> coffee or something stronger and later in the day. It doesn't matter. And just sit very quietly and watch where you have water. And you can see the wildlife coming in and using it. You know, wildlife from native bees to honeybees, which are lovely Italian fellows, um, <laughs> bumblebees, butterflies. Uh, another thing that's a lot of fun to do when you have native plants, particularly white flowering native plants, is if you wait until dusk, or even after it gets dark, sometimes you'll see the moths coming in and nectaring from the light colored flowers at night, which is a lot of fun. Um, people don't expect moths to do that, but that's a, that's a fun thing to watch as well. Yeah, it's very fun. Or put out some sugary sweets for the moths later sure. at night and then go watch for them. That's always fun. True, true. Mothing, mothing is great fun. And and quite frankly, I think the uh, folks that uh, name moths um, they have a lot more fun than the ones that name butterflies because there's a lot of just fabulously named moths. Oh, yeah. So, you know, funereal daggers and all kinds of uh, wonderful, wonderful named moths. Wonderful names. Yes. But even going back to the water again, we, we keep circling back to the water. Um, <laughs> we do. Yes. But it's so much fun to play in the water. Um, it is. But you don't even have to have water that I have a pond that's there or a puddle that's there all the time you can do vernal pools oh yeah which they're really shallow they're there during the rainy season they dry up by the time you get to the driest part of the summer and then they come back with the rainy season and those can support again so much amazing life and dragonflies and frogs and you'll have a lot more frogs and salamanders usually with the <laughs> vernal pools because you don't have fish to eat the babies um or eat that's the true. eggs that's true you know and and one of the things in, in our area we, we've had some really crazy storms in recent years with global warming god only knows how much crazier our storms are going to get but you know another thing that folks can do is um put in rain gardens you know, which actually works sort of like vernal pools, but they sort of come and go. Um, you know, a rain garden, and it can be a sump pump garden. You know, you have a basement that, you know, you have the sump pump that's always seemingly run. We'll put a garden at the end of the outflow, um, which will be a lot more attractive than it was when the sump pump was just spitting out as it was. Mm -hmm. But this is a way to sort of hold on to some of that water, let the water percolate through. You can put some great native species in there because... Again, native plants are really diverse and very flexible. And there are a lot of native plants that can take that wet and dry cycle. Mm -hmm. you know, whether you're talking about the vernal pool that you're talking about, which is wet in the spring and then dry in the summer, or a rain garden that gets really wet certain times of the year, but then dries out in between. 
Um, there are a lot of native plants that will thrive under those situations, along with supporting the wildlife that's going to be there. Uh, I like to have some rocks in and amongst or near the rain garden because that gives the wildlife, the salamanders and various things, some place to go when things get a little dry. Under the rocks is always a little bit more moist, so it gives them a place to hide. But that's another thing that you can do as a water feature on your property. Yes. I mean, there's so much. And like you said, there's native plants that there's some really gorgeous native plants that are adapted to wet and wet dry cycles. And yeah, there's lots that you could do with that. Yeah, it's uh, the, the I think one of the things that people don't understand is the great diversity of native plants mm -hmm. you know, and how much they have. When, when, when we go to a typical garden center, most of the plants that are going to be there are going to be adapted to full sun and average average moisture. Yeah, that's it. Um, and when you look at the great diversity of native plants in your region, whatever region you are in, there's going to be plants that are adapted for all these different zones. You know, if you're looking at a vernal pool or a rain garden, there's going to be plants that are going to be adapted to sort of the edge that dries out more frequently. There's going to be plants that are going to be adapted to the slopey area where it tends to stay a little moister. Sometimes it gets floods, sometimes it dries out, and there are going to be plants that are adapted to the bottom where there's almost always a little bit of moisture left. Um, it just gives a lot more flexibility, really, mm -hmm. in gardening. And, and maybe I think that's one of the things that daunts people sometimes. There's so many choices. Yes. Um, but by really embracing that diversity, you also can invite a lot of different wildlife into your garden which is really interesting because a lot of butterflies and moths are very specific about the host plant that they need. Uh, they're kind of choosy, really. Uh, so you need to, you need to um, like white turtle head is a really nice one. Uh, beautiful plant, likes it a little bit moist. It is functionally the only host plant of Baltimore checker spot butterflies. That's where they want to lay their eggs. The first instar caterpillars really want that plant. The second instar caterpillars really want that plant. They overwinter in little leafy nests at the base of the plant, like a couple little caterpillars to get together and overwinter. And then come spring when they emerge in the spring, they'll, they'll feed on anything to finish. But, the, but to start with, they really want to have white turtle head. Um, so, so that's a really great one. Um, the Baltimore checker spots don't travel very far to find host plants. Um, so, you know, if you plant it, you know, there's not going to be a Baltimore checker spot that's going to fly over from three counties over just looking to see if you happen to have a white turtle head. But, you know, if there's white turtle heads in your community or a couple properties over, you might expand the distribution of that butterfly, which is great fun. And that's, again, where little properties can make a big difference because they can be those stepping stones. Exactly. Exactly. Wildlife corridors, really. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean... I think more and more people are recognizing that and it's becoming something that more people are trying to do, which is really exciting. It is exciting. So many insects can't travel, like you said, a real long distance from one location to another to search for a host plant. Well, one of the things that's, that is very interesting is that, you know, we, we focus so much in education on monarch butterflies, um, which is wonderful. I love monarch mm -hmm. butterflies. They're terrific insects. But they fly to Mexico every year, which is amazing. And then they fly back to Mexico, which is amazing. But when we focus so much on that insect, we forget that the vast majority of the butterflies and the beetles and the bees in our gardens spend the winter in your garden. They spend the winter in your garden as eggs or as chrysalises or in little nests under the ground, or in hollow stems. Um, so one of the one of the things that, that I think is very important, and another thing people can do is they're trying to increase the wildlife value of their gardens and, and how lively they are with wildlife, is not only leave the leaves, which you've probably heard, you know, stop mm -hmm. raking away all the leaves and sending them to the curb, but let the stems stand. Yes. You know, it's, I have a bad habit, freely admit, when I walk, I used to, 
like to break off dead stems and just snap them in my fingers while I'm walking. I don't know why I did this. I just did it. I've tried to break myself. This happened because I keep finding negative bees in the stems. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I have to <laughs> stop doing that. Um, because there are native bees that overwinter in hollow stems. Um, bumblebees, they they form great little nests at, at, at soil level. Um, if you grow blue false indigo, which is a lovely native plant, Baptisia australis, mm -hmm. when those flower, the bumblebees that are nectaring on those are almost always queens. That's when the queens emerge and start, because the queens overwinter for bumblebees, and then they start making a new nest. So I always love the fact that the bumblebees on Baptisia are almost always queens. So it's like, oh, it's a queen. <laughs> um, I think it's fun. But, you know, it doesn't mean that we need to leave our property untended looking. You know, the area of lawn you want to preserve, you, you can rake the leaves to the side, rake them underneath your trees. Uh, use the leaves for mulch. Don't run them through a chipper first. You'll kill all the insects that are on them. But rake the leaves to the side. Um, many native plants, the, the winter stems are actually gorgeous. I never cut back almost any of my native stems. But you know, as I tell people, if you've got milkweed next to your walkway and they've all fallen into the walkway, you don't need to leave them there to, to trip your aunt on her way in for Thanksgiving dinner. Cut back the ones that have gotten into the way, but just lay them down. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to pack them away. Um, I, uh, I I wrote a thing a couple of years ago about brush piles. Oh, yeah. You know, when, when I was a kid, everybody had a brush pile. You didn't pack all of your stuff away. Actually, my dad had two brush piles. We had one for just leaves and one's for sort of larger garden things, sticks. And and so, you know, if you've got overwintering bees that are in that upright stem, well, they're not going to mind if you put the stem horizontal in your brush pile. And the birds and the wildlife will love the brush pile in the winter. It's a wonderful thing to do. And you can do a brush pile even on a pretty small property. Uh, you don't need to have a giant brush pile. If you have a small property, you're not going to be producing that much brush. But instead of the uh, meticulous removing of all the vegetation, all the dead stems, all the leaves, everything from our property in the fall and sending them to a landfill somewhere, you know, you've spent the entire summer with a pollinator garden, trying to encourage pollinators to the garden and trying to encourage butterflies. And you've just removed all the overwintering butterflies and bees and mm -hmm. taken them to the landfill. Um, we forget that you need winter habitat for them as well. Right, because- Which is really what we're doing by leaving. Right, because we, we, we talk about monarchs so much and I love monarchs, but all the insects don't fly away. Right. I've actually had someone interrupt me in a lecture when I started talking about overwintering insects. He's like, no, all insects die in the winter. It's like, no, no, they don't. Yeah. You know, most of them are trying to overwinter in your garden. In one form or stage or another. It's right. not like, poof, they magically appear in the spring. <laughs> yeah, I think I asked him about that. He kind of got a blind look on his face. But yeah, it's um, it's out of sight, out of mind. We don't really think about where insects go in the winter. A question I like to ask people is, uh, when I'm talking about butterflies and moths, I ask them, where, where do butterflies go at night? Nobody thinks about it. And I think the cutest answer I ever got was a little kid said, do they turn into moths? <laughs> <laughs> but of course, butterflies, many of them, they will hang from a leaf and fold their wings behind them and hang upside down from a leaf. And as the light declines, it makes them just look like a leaf because they don't want to be eaten by bats and by other nighttime predators. Um, they just want to hide. Nothing to be seen here. I'm just a leaf hanging from this tree. It's all fine. And moths do something similar during the day, except for they tend to sort of flatten themselves out against trees and, and other surfaces where they can camouflage. But we don't we don't think about things. Don't think about where things go at night. Don't think about things where they go in the winter. And I mean, I honestly didn't for a very long time. And then I was like, oh, what? <laughs> how did I not make this connection? <laughs> Well, because we, we didn't think about it. We didn't think about it. You know, and it's one of the things that I, I like about explaining about the interaction between native plants and insects to people because often people don't value what they don't know. Right. Well, how can you? If you don't know it exists, how do you value it? Or they're afraid of it. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you're like, well, I don't know what that is. So I guess I'll kill it. No, no. <laughs> um, you know, learning those interactions between the plants and the insects and how important they are to each other is really, uh, and the education I think is really the key, helping people, people understand that. I think so too. Well, a couple of quick questions here. Sure. Because you do mail order. I do. Uh, we've had this fabulous conversation and have gone <laughs> all different ways. And it's been so much fun. I'm so glad we've just had this conversation. But I wanted to ask you about mail order plants and native sure. plants. Because a lot of people, yes, you want to get native plants as close to your local area as possible. Yes. As long as they've got the native ecoregions and plants from that area too. That's always helpful, but sometimes we can't. Right. And so people mail order. In that case, you're looking at either buying seeds or you're mail ordering plants. Um, and since you've done mail order for so long, are there tips and tricks, things that people should know if they're doing mail order plants that would make planting them more likely to be successful when you're purchasing plants and having them shipped through the mail? Because I can imagine that could cause some crazy situations. And some challenges? Well, there aren't that many native plant nurseries <laughs> that are mail order, to be fair. Um, but if you order, make sure that you're still looking for plants that are native to your area. You know, if it's a very exciting plant, um, but it's only native to northern Maine, and you're in Florida, probably a bad choice. Um, and the reverse is true. You know, you're in you're in northern Maine. It's just like, oh, I love that's native. It's well, if it's native to Florida, it, there's relatively few plants that are native to South Florida and northern Maine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, still focus on plants that are native to your region. And one of the things, and and this has to do with expectations, really, of native plants. Um, most native plant nurseries that are that are mail order are not going to be forcing those plants. Um, you know, it's one of the things that we explain to people. Is most of our native plants that we sell, with very few exceptions, are outside almost all year. They're not in a heated, lovely greenhouse that's being misted periodically and extra warm and big lights. We don't do any of that because we're dealing with native perennial plants. They are tough. If, you know, really wherever you are, if you order from us in the first week of April, our plants are gonna be synchronized to our climate in the first week of April. They're gonna be synchronized to that. If you're, you know, a zone or two away, they'll catch up, you know, they'll be fine. But again, plants grow, plants grow. What you're buying, I was talking to a, a wholesale native plant nurseryman um, from over in Pennsylvania at a conference a couple of weeks ago. And he says, what we sell is roots. <laughs> but he's he's a tree seller. All they do is trees and shrubs. He's like, we're selling healthy roots. That's what we sell. Um, but I think that the real key in mail ordering um, native plants is, is make sure you're still focusing on things that are native to your region. And a bit jokingly, I suppose, and if you want to order asters for the fall, order them in the spring. It's so much easier to ship an aster when it's small. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Before it's, you know, before it's it's three or four feet tall. Um, because then we need to cut them back to get them to to ship healthy that way. Um, order them a little bit before you need them is always a good idea. But focus on things that are native to your area, I think is probably probably key. You know, we as I mentioned, where we are. Um, if you look at the eco region three level three map, there are you know within about fifty miles of us, I think there's eight different major eco regions that come together. Um, we are within a stone's throw of four major eco regions here. So we've got in our area, we both have an enormous amount of diversity, but we also are really ideally suited to we we grow things that are native pretty far down in the south because we're at the northern tip of that eco region. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and likewise, we're at the southern tip of a bunch of other eco regions. So we have a lot of diversity there. But having said that, I mean, he's Baptisia australis, mentioned that before. 
uh, blue false indigo, the one that the queen bumblebees come to. It is native to, I think, Maine to Georgia. If you're in Georgia, if you can find someone in Georgia selling that plant that's got Georgia genetics, get that plant. Don't get one from a native plant seller up in Maine. You know, you, you getting native plants from as local as you can is a lovely idea. Um, but as you say, they're, they're not always available. That's where the as you can part of that statement comes in. As you can, as you can. Um, and please, please, please. And this is this is has nothing to do with my business, but please make sure that you're 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 buying these seeds, you're buying these plants from reputable native plant nurseries. Please do not simply go out and go try to dig and move native plants. The whole point of the native plant movement is to make more native plants, not simply take them from the wild illegally and move them around. Um, unfortunately, our national parks and state parks still have quite a problem in some areas with people poaching wildflowers, particularly uh, slow growing or difficult to grow wildflowers. The US Forest Service actually has a really nice little short article on it that has some depressing pictures of areas that have been poached. So, so please buy your native plants from a reputable seller or your seeds for that matter. Yeah, there's been a lot of problems with poaching of native plants on public parks and stuff like that in a lot of areas. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a huge problem. And a lot of people don't even realize what they're doing is wrong. Mm -mm. Um, and and before you know it, they're all gone. Um, there's a, a picture, which I wish I had. I need to go down to, go back down to Brevard County, Florida, but the zoo down there, I hope they still have the display. Um, they used to have this this beautiful memorial wall, and it was to all the orchids which are now extinct in their county, extirpated technically in their county, because people have collected them in the wild, so that you can't they're no longer in their county uh, because people have collected them to death. Um, and we shouldn't do that to any any native plant, any native creature should never happen. Well, I have a feeling that we could go on and talk for multiple hours here, <laughs> but uh, probably should think about wrapping it up. So is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we go? I have been really enjoying this. Um, I'll put on one of my other hats very briefly. I'm also president of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey currently. Uh, so I would encourage wherever you are, uh, look to the Native Plant Societies in your area uh in your state in your region um there are great resources for um, information about native plants and often native plant nurseries as well in your area so i would um, encourage everyone to um you know i'll give a plug to the native plant society of new jersey but certainly there are a lot of native plant societies around the country and i hope that you'll all take a look to see what's in your area and learn more about native plants in your area and how you might be able to integrate them into your landscape and invite more wildlife into your gardens. I think that's a great way to wrap this up. So like I said, this has been really interesting. We could keep going for quite a while longer, I'm sure. But if people want to get in touch, ask questions, maybe they live near New Jersey and say, hey, I want some native plants. Maybe I can check out her nursery. Can they email you and ask questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. They can email me at randy at toadshade.com. Or you can just go to our website, which is just www.toadshade.com. We try to keep it simple. And we have a Facebook page as well. So, you know, visit us any of those places. You can email me with questions. You can browse our website. I've got a, a blog archive on there that you can go in and 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 see what we've had to say in the past. And a lot of information on both growing native plants, starting native plants from seed. We have almost 300 different species of native plant seed that are available as well as plants. And a lot of great information on the website. So I hope you'll, uh, if you have questions, you can email me or you can just go and take a look and see what the website has to say. And I will have links. I'll have your email address and links to your website, Facebook page, in the show notes as well. So terrific. Thanks so much. 
make it easy for people because I'm like, keep it as simple as possible. (laughs) But yeah, thanks again for talking with us and have a great day. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Yes, me too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. I really appreciate Randy taking the time to talk with us. Her knowledge and love of nature shines through and is contagious, even for someone like me, who is already a confirmed lifelong nature nerd. I know after talking with Randy, I am definitely going to be looking for a patch of closed gentians where I can sit and watch for bumblebees this year. I also encourage you to check out her Toadshade Wildflower Farm website and blog. She has tons of wonderful plants and information there. As I said before, there are links in the show notes to all of the resources that we talked about. If you find value in the Backyard Ecology content, please consider making a one-time or monthly donation. You can find out how at www.backyardecology.net slash support. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to explore the nature in your own yard and community.